Signore e signori, buonasera, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, and welcome to the fourth talk with uh, Professor Giovanni Aloy, dedicated to the history of Italian photography. Today, we focus on Italian contemporary photography under the title In Search for New Realism. I would like to welcome uh, Giovanni. Thank you very much for being uh, with us once more. Uh, Giovanni is an art historian um, who focused his academic attention on photography and on the representation of art in contemporary art. And he's a current lecturer at the Chicago School of the Art Institute and at the Sotheby Institute uh, for Art in New York and London. Giovanni, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luca. Always a pleasure to be here virtually and soon perhaps in person again. Thank you all for following us um, every uh, for every meeting of this very exciting series on Italian photography. Uh, this is the last of the four lectures I promised to deliver as part of this program. And I can tell you now that we have two more uh, sessions, which will be conversations between me and contemporary Italian photographers, uh, Marco Garofalo and Silvia Camporesi. Uh, we will soon announce the dates for these events and they will happen sometimes in early June. Those conversations will give us an opportunity to um, explore, again, some of the themes that I've discussed with you during the series of lectures, but also to expand what we haven't had the opportunity to um, map, because of course there is so much to talk about and always such little time. I just wanted to also thank those of you who have sent me very kind, uh, appreciative messages about the series and who um, remind me that this is very useful. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it, and I hope you will enjoy our last installment today. So I'm going to share my screen here. And I just wanted to begin with a quick reminder of what uh, we have seen together. By the way, the um, lectures have been recorded and they're available on YouTube. So you can just type up my name, photography, and you will find them. Just a reminder, um, we started looking at the uh, Camera Obscura, the very beginning of photography, constructing identities in the second half of the 19th century, then moving on to dynamism, ideology, and power, and today, contemporary Italian photography in search of a new realism. So the journey um, was structured with a sense of, um, limitation in mind. You know, there's no way I could possibly do justice to the history of photography in Italy over four lectures uh, of an hour each. And as you might remember, when we began our journey starting in 1839 with the launch of photography in Paris, I soon uh, started to focus on the impact of photography in Italy and the importance of Italian-born photography, like the kind we saw um, with Luigi Sacchi, for instance, uh, and Giacomo Caneva, one, uh, two of the most important early photographers in Italy. And we soon appreciated the importance of the foreign eye, the eye of researchers, art historians, and artists who immediately travel to Italy in order to record its beauty from their perspective. We explore the complexity involved in this situation, this um, limitation of representation. It's almost like foreigners, those who didn't, weren't born in Italy, made portraits of Italy for Italians and for the rest of the world. And I think that's a very interesting um, starting point to think about the construction of identity in Italy through photography. As you will remember too, I entertained you with the Contessa di Castiglione, the feminine, a, a female protagonist of the um, second half of the 19th century, who understood that photography is more than documentation and that it can help us invent characters as well as it help us to construct identity 
in search of who we are to try to understand where we're going. And in that context, we also acknowledge that photography never is objective and never really says the truth. As you will remember, we looked at retouching and also the earliest formation of an Italian identity through photography. It's always interesting to remember that in a world without TV, in a world without the internet, the unification of Italy, which becomes the important focal moment in the history of early Italian photography, really owed so much to this new medium. How could people that had never met each other, people from the North and people from the South, understand who they are if not through photography. For as superficial as that approach was, photography changed the history of representation and identity. You will remember too that I talked about the Macchiaioli, how photography impacted the history of painting and how the two engaged in a very interesting dialogue, constructing reality for posterity, the importance of photography as political document. You will remember Garibaldi's portrait, the truthful one and the fake ones that circulated at the time, as well as the first instance of fake news in Italy with this very important image of the Breccia di Porta Pia and the beginning of Italian color photography. So suddenly that dream of obsolescence, the past, the dreamy memory of an Italy that was, is also available in color. During the uh, last talk, we also looked at photography and reality, which leads up to today. We looked at how photography documented the histories of immigrants and how artists like Tina Modotti used photography in a surrealist way in order to create metaphors that turned on a political edge. And also the experimentation with photography um, becoming a little older by the first 20 years of the last century, photographers want to do more than documenting reality, especially those who begin to believe that photography can be a true fully fledged form of art like Bragaglia, experiment in the context of futurism and then in the context of the political reality, the changing political reality of Italy through ideology. We looked at how uh, Mussolini, fascism, uh, really used photography in a very savvy way, the importance of propaganda and uh, the, the ability of photography to communicate content quickly and um, in a very succinct way is essential to the rise of power of Mussolini. We looked at the artistic and propagandistic interface uh, that photography inhabits during the 1930s. And of course, the rise of documentation struggling the poetic um, range of expression too. Uh, the idea of the photo essay, like we saw in Federico Patellani's work, which as you will see, will feed into the examples that I have lined up for you today. Uh, last time I saw you a month ago, we wrapped up with a bit of a lighthearted uh, tone with the um, pioneering photographic work of Chiara Samugeo, one of the icons of Italian photography, who had the opportunity to immortalize so many of the uh, international as well as Italian stars of the uh, 60s, 70s, and still today. Uh, also important, the humor of the photographer beyond her ability to capture stars like nobody else had done today. And today we're picking up with the idea of landscape. As you will remember, landscape was our starting point. The first lecture focused on landscape, especially because photography was a technically limited medium. We have to acknowledge that Technologically, photography develops incredibly quickly, but what photographers can accomplish during the first 50 years of the history of photography between uh, 1839 and the 1870s, all the way up to the 90s, is complicated by technical limitations. Low 
um, lighting is very problematic for photography as well as its long exposure times. Um, people are very rare in the representation of early photography for this very reason, apart from the daguerreotype where in the studio photographers can use artificial lighting sources in order to capture the, the, the image of a human without too many blurring effects. But landscape is certainly where Italy has the opportunity to construct its identity based on the history that it's unparalleled, unparalleled in, uh, in Europe. And also, let's say that the landscape, the Italian landscape, it's this sort of battleground where Italian artists as well as foreign artists uh, take the opportunity to define the identity of the country. Those of you who have seen my lectures for the Italian Institute of Culture before might remember a cycle of lectures that's now two years old dedicated to Arte Povera. You can also find these lectures on YouTube and I want to bring you back, those of you who remember the lectures, great. Those of you who don't, I have a super quick um, summary of what Arte Povera was because in a sense, the moment that generated the art movement Arte Povera is also influential to what happens in photography during the 1960s, 70s and beyond. So Arte Povera was this incredible contemporary art movement that rejected so much of the conventions of classical as well as modern art. It's connected to the Miracolo Italiano. The Miracolo Italiano was the Italian miracle and it had nothing to do with food, but it had to do with the economy and the um, coming out of the Second World War and a sense of um, financial stability and positivity, which led to this sense of freedom and independence among Italian people, which led artists to experiment more and feel a sense of revolution, something that could be finally changed about the past during the 50s and 60s seemed palpable. And of course, as we all know, that unfortunately, that sense of revolutionary power for Italy ends up in a sense of delusion, a delusione, because unfortunately, the economic scenario changes and there is a sense of that initial sprint coming to an end. So just to remind you what Arte Povera looks like, well, Arte Povera means poor art. Artists engaging with poor materials, as we can see here in the, ca in the, in the case of Alighiero Boetti, in the work of Marisa Mertz, as well as Michelangelo Pistoletto. But we also looked at the irreverence of Arte Povera in the context of new circumstances and concerns that Arte Povera was the first to map. And these have to do with the environmental changes that artists witnessed in Italy at the time. And as you will see, a lot of what we explore today will be entirely focused on the idea of environmentalism, the representation of the land, and how Italian photographers were determined from a certain point onwards, which roughly aligns with the end of the 1960s, roughly 1968, 1972, with the end of Arte Povera. The, the general idea became to discard the stereotypes that we're all very familiar with across the world of a beautiful and unproblematic Italy that sits um, comfortably uh, on, on, it, on its past and that it's stuck in time. So the aesthetics, if you like, that have characterized the image of Italy around the world through photography mainly uh, produced by external foreigner photographers uh, becomes the target, becomes the issue that contemporary Italian photographers want to address. So in order to begin our journey, I wanted to bring you back to an artist we explored uh, last month, Mario Giacomelli. Uh, this series doesn't have anything to do with environmentalism, but I'm just trying to uh, jig your memory here 
you might remember that uh, Mario Giacomelli will become one of the most uh, celebrated artists and especially photographers in uh, um, Europe and eventually in the United States as well, especially because of the series titled Io non ho mani che mi accarezzino il volto, which means I don't have hands that caress my face. And it's a very playful take. You will see that to the, to, tonight I'm drawing connections in a bit of a crisscrossing way. When we look at the work of Oliviero Toscani, you will see some of this irony and lightheartedness perhaps coming through in a much more provocative way. Uh, there's also something particularly interesting about Giacomelli's idea of contrast, as you can see in these images, in which he pushes the contrast so much that the um, uh, priests are almost the equivalent of a typographic impression while the rest of the environment is washed out by an overexposure. When it comes to Mario Giacomelli, however, what I want to focus on with you is his representation of landscapes, which are uh, radically different from anything we had seen before in Italy. They are, in a sense, visionary. And they are something more than documentation. This is the difficult edge upon which Mario Giacomelli positions himself as a pioneer photographer of the Italian landscape. As you can see from this photograph, there is a sense of ambiguity. The sense of ambiguity is accomplished once again with the use of the high contrast and with framing and composition that tend to abstract the landscape. So while uh, we know the uh, locations of uh, Giacomelli's uh, photographs, many of these were taken in the Marche uh, in Italy, we also get a sense that Giacomelli is trying to transpose the uh, photographic uh, through the photographic language is trying to transpose the reality of the language of, of the landscape in order to suggest something more. What are the concerns of Giacomelli? Well, Giacomelli uh, previously had taken images, lots of images of peasants. And one of the things he enjoys, he finds stimulating about peasants is the truth he sees on their faces. The lines on their faces are part of a history. They're part of who they are and part of their identity. It transposes this idea of the lines on somebody's face as something personal to the land itself. And he begins to take this aerial photograph. So he hires a Piper plane and he starts to take aerial photographs of Italy, which had never been seen before in this context. And he pays a lot of attention to the lines, as you can see here. So the lines that cut through the countryside are the equivalent of the lines on the peasants' uh, faces. And this project, uh, which lasts uh, an extensive period of time, explores the Italian uh, landscape in a way that really brings the earliest, if you like, manifestations, the first concerns in art of the changing landscape. The changing landscape that can be seen as degradation, but also the changing landscape that can be seen as a, a natural and human relationship, that it's a negotiation. Of his use of photography, uh, Giacomelli says that for him, the photographic film is like a printing plate, uh, a lithograph where images and emotions become stratified. And I really like this term, the stratification, because when you actually look at some of the images that Giacomelli took, you can almost see uh, a section of a um, strata, like a uh, a section of the land, a section of territory that's being cut vertically. There's a sense of creativity and there's also a sense of imagination, a sense of realism that today we will see uh, more and more with some of the photographers that I will present to you. There's something about also loss uh, and, and, and uncertainty in these images. The idea that the agricultural approaches that were characterizing Italy at the time during the 1950s 
were somewhat less and less respectful of the land and that they were transforming the land into something that was ultimately impoverished. This idea of the impoverishment of the land becomes more pronounced during the body of work that Giacomelli produces starting with the 1970s and into the 80s. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Edward Bertinsky, but Edward Bertinsky is a very well-known contemporary photographer who takes aerial photography of um, scenes of pollution and destruction caused by human activities from around the world. And his images are in color, so they're very different from Giacomelli, but you can also imagine that it is a very similar project that Giacomelli started very uh, earlier on, much, much earlier than, than Bertinsky, that it's been somewhat updated uh, aesthetically as well as contextually. Bertinsky talks of the Anthropocene uh, today, while Giacomelli at that point didn't have those uh, concepts uh, at hand in order to further contextualize his work. And perhaps it was also a little premature to talk about the age of man in the context of the Anthropocene. But you can see how these photographs are essentially laying the foundations of those discourses and also set the aesthetic blueprint of what other contemporary artists will eventually accomplish. So I invite you to take a look, look up Edward Bertinsky and maybe some more of Mario Giacomelli's photographs after my talk and you will see the uh, parallelisms here, maybe find them interesting. Another important chapter that uh, we have to explore today in the context of Italian photography from the 60s to today is neorealism. Neorealism is an incredibly important movement in cinema and literature that starts during the 1950s. And there is something fascinating about neorealism because it's related to the struggle of coming out of the Second World War. And again, it's connected to what Arte Povera will find uh, particularly interesting and problematic. There is a vision of the existing poverty and desolation that recurs uh, in the imaginary of neorealism that it's somewhat haunting and that perhaps those of you have had the opportunity to see Italy beyond the stereotypes of the monuments and the uh, tourist highlights will be familiar with and recognize this Italy as also very true, if perhaps even truer than the Italy of the monuments, the Italy of the historical uh, landmark. Something interesting about neorealism is certainly this uh, honesty. I mean, the term says it, it's a new kind of realism and the new kind of realism shies away from the rhetoric of the past. The question then becomes why look at these photographs when we could take another picture of the Colosseum, when we can take another picture of Milan's Duomo or Venice. Uh, Venice is not really the place for neorealism. The idea is really to think about um, the reality of everyday life. So there is a shift from the rhetoric to the everyday life of a series of situation that in a sense seem somewhat unimportant. And the desolation of Milan, for instance, as you see here, the title says Periferie di Milano, which is the periphery of the city with a new architectural appearance of uh, a building that's much taller and much more imposing than the architecture you find in the heart of the city and these open spaces, which once upon a time, not so long ago, were fields that have now turned and are turning uh, into uh, important possibility and opportunities for the city to develop. So there's a, a future promise, as we can see here, in the desolation of the images taken by uh, Ugo Mulas. Now, uh, Ugo Mulas was a really interesting um, photographer who straddled the commercial and the artistic. 
And since 1954, he photographed the Venice Biennale until the 1970s every year. So let's say that his approach is documentaristic and he's to a set, in a sense um, connected to the idea of documenting what he sees without um, manipulating too much. So you can see the contrast here, for instance, of the images are not as stark and interpretative as we saw with Giacomelli, but he returns almost insistently to this sense of alienation, loneliness, and uh, poverty of the periphery, a complete contrast with the um, Italy that's celebrated and that it's desired. There is something very um, touching, I think, about the anonymity of the working classes he also captures, you know, the, the two women we saw passing by, there's a sense of vulnerability, there's a sense of abandonment, and certainly a sense of lack of cultural opportunities that populates these images. But as I said earlier, um, Hugo Mules was also involved in more documentaristic commercial opportunity. I mentioned the Venice Biennale, and this is a photograph I am particularly fond of because it was taken very close to um, where I was born in Milan and uh, where I spent my youth as a kid running around the Navigli, the canals of Milan, the very old canals. It was lucky that way um, to having been born in a beautiful uh, corner in Milan. And this very unusual representation, this very unusual photographic presentation of a beautiful model, as you can see here, wearing a gala dress situated in what at the time was an industrial site. You know, one of uh, the section of the canals in Milan in this case was used especially to carry into the city uh, industrial materials used for construction. The, the canal network in Milan was originally mapped by Leonardo, so it has a, an incredible uh, historical um, value, but at the same time, uh, it did sort of lose its charm during the 1980s. It became uh, a, a more industrial reality. And the idea to take fashion outside of the studio, which today to us sounds like, of course, was not common at all in the 1950s. And many claim that Ugo Mula started this process of situating high fashion into places that suggest a completely different uh, social makeup and reality. So a very interesting opportunity to appreciate the contrast of different Milans emerging, the Milan that will become the capital of fashion and also the modern Milan that it's uh, rising uh, from the industrial opportunities that it has generated already during the uh, late 40s and early 50s. Beautiful images here by another master of Italian photographer, Gab uh, photography, Gabriele Basilico. This beautiful image called Stazione. This is clearly a station, as you can see here. And one of the things I like the most about Gabriele Basilico is his ability to, again, in the connection with uh, neorealism, suggest narratives, as you can see here. This almost looks like a film still. We see a man coming up the stairs and we don't know necessarily which train he's going to get, where is he going and why. There's a, a beautiful symmetry in this image and uh, a very tactful, very delicate treatment of a space that's been charged with these poetic um, ideas. The station has always been an important uh, place in the history of Italian art, thanks to the futurists who were in love with trains. And I'm thinking about the paintings by Boccioni, uh, in which he captured the essence of those who stay and those who are left behind, uh, those who leave. There's a very interesting uh, set of poetics that revolves around the station uh, and uh, Italian art. And of course, Basilico also, uh, in a sense, exploring the vernacular of neorealism uh, further with the architectural stru structures of the gasometry. You can see here this relatively uh, fascinating structures that are monuments to progress and to the comfort of a new lifestyle. We're in Naples. 
uh, Naples here, and you can see clearly how there are different realities represented by brick walls that look dated and all been adjoined to newer walls. So the idea of expansion, but also these towering structures, which are really monuments of a present that suggests uh, a sort of ability to harness the power of nature and um, enrich urban realities. Everything, as you can see, said very uh, succinctly and very um, in a very uh, simple way. The simplicity we can see here also in these very desolate uh, images of Sesto San Giovanni just outside uh, Milan. You can see here that people are rendered very marginal. There seems to be a person perhaps over here in the distance. There's a little bit of the scream by Munch in this perspective and the loneliness. And again, this towering uh, industrial structure like a, a water reservoir and another uh, gas gasometer uh, on the left. Uh, the, the periphery becomes a little bit the emblem of a changing Italy. Uh, it becomes this place of alienation that it's not quite the city and that at the same time is an opportunity, a promise that at this time, and as you can see, even in the 1990s, is still a question mark, is still a, um, an unresolved proposition based on the economic proudness and desire of progress and wealth, but also driven by these questions of efficiency rather than aesthetics or quality of living. And another interesting uh, image here by Gianni Berengo Gardin, who's uh, now in his 90s, another uh, Italian photographer, um, who explored the city of Milan. I'm sure by now you've noticed that despite the fact that color photography was invented a long time ago in the 1860s, black and white photography still predominates the artistic sphere in Italy. I'm sure we will be able to talk about this a little bit more, uh, perhaps in the conversations that will follow our series. But you have to remember that more than other countries, Italy had a very rough time accepting photography as a legitimate art form. This is mainly because uh, photography has a history, a very complex and rich history of art based on painting, sculpture, and architecture. So much more than other places in Europe, um, photography has struggled in Italy to break through and win the hearts and minds of the Italian audience uh, for obvious reasons. And using black and white, which is a tried and tested strategy to ennoble photography in an artistic sense is perhaps even more important to uh, photography in Italy than it is anywhere else. There's something important about the documentation here, the struggle between documenting, commenting, uh, even in an ironic way, as you can see here, this is an uh, advert for tuna and the strange clash that advertising brings to the images of a modern, organized, regimented and almost futuristic. You know, these trams don't look futuristic to us today, but in the 1980s, they were, uh, they represented the way in which the, the city moved about, in a way in which an efficient city like Milan could move around fast. And another beautiful image here by Gardin, the Vaporetto uh, in Venice from the 1960s, in which you can see how there's a sense of surrealism. Again, those of you who are familiar with the photograph of the surrealist Age, my um, notice that there's a similarity here in the reflection, how reflection and windows become ambiguous to the point that space is problematized and complicated in very poetic ways. You can see this man here on the left-hand side holding his ear out, maybe to hear an announcement or overhearing somebody else um, sort of uh, nosing into somebody else's conversation while uh, we have an official uh, figure here looking down on others. There's so many opportunities for narratives and um, 
those fantasies that become so fascinating during those moments in which we people watch, which is intrinsic to photography itself. You will remember that during the 19th century, the flaneur uh, in France became the people watcher, basically became such an important figure uh, in the cultural makeup of modern culture. And um, a quick touchdown on Letizia Battaglia, who uh, is a photographer, one of the female protagonists of Italian photographer, who uh, instead of photographing empty peripheries or uh, a sense of alienation, was perhaps more concerned with photographing the reality of Sicily and the um, complicated times uh, Sicily has had for many uh, decades now because of the mafia. So you can see here uh, an Easter Sunday celebration, which is clearly a moment of joy. But many of the images taken by Letizia Battaglia throughout her career are also very brave documentation of the um, pain and death caused by the mafia. They struggle the line of documentary and art in um, very interesting ways, very pioneering ways. And the photographer herself has actually risked, risked their life uh, more than once by rushing to the scenes um, in which uh, the mafia would kill or um, commit crimes to document in this, again, poetic way, in this a uh, way that transcends uh, the documentary. And in a way, trying to humanize what the news would report as uh, an endemic problem that seems unsolvable. So that's where the, the photography of Letizia Battaglia really uh, inserts itself and in the humanizing uh, of the, the, the side of Sicily that doesn't have space to show itself uh, on the news and on the official outlets of um, Italian broadcasting and television newspapers. Landscape. Back to landscape, our main key concern for uh, tonight's lecture. I wanted to uh, show you again some of the images we looked at in the first lecture to remind you how the ghost of representations past Ponce early photography, as we have seen um, earlier. These are the images that contemporary photographers, Italian photographers, are not interested in. And these are the photographs. Um, they want to counterbalance. I think what's important to remember is that they don't want to forget them. This Italy does exist, but it's a rhetorical Italy, an unproblematic Italy that they no longer feel is the Italy they know. So one of the pioneers of this landscape school, as it is called in Italy, is the amazing Luigi Ghirri. And you're probably wondering, why are you talking about Luigi Ghirri? But you're showing us this picture, which is the very famous blue marble taken by NASA in 1972, because this image has a, had a massive impact on Luigi Ghirri. And to be honest with you, um, if we had time to do an hour with Luigi Ghirri, just about Luigi Ghirri, I would do it because he is an incredible photographer. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He died um, in 1949, in, uh, sorry, he died at the age of 49 and um, in 1992. And uh, I'll tell you more about it uh, as we go through his work. But this image was particularly influential to Gary because to him, it really changed the scope and the perspective of his work. He basically felt that at that point in the early 70s, we had seen the smallest particle, the atom at the time, and this space views of Earth. So we finally had seen the smallest and the largest within our human conception, that he felt overwhelmed by these polarities and came to conclusion that photography, the mechanical image, is the only way through which we can actually comprehend the world. And he has a point. 
he has a point because I don't know how many of you have had the chance to go in outer space and see the world for what it is. So our conception of what planet Earth looks like comes from photographs. And we also have to rely on scientific representations for the micro uh, cosmos. So in a sense, um, Luigi Giri is a conceptual photographer, conceptual photographer who works in many disparate ways and um, disparate ways. And one of the uh, projects I think I like the most is this Atlante, which is an atlas. Um, it's humorous, but it's so poignant at the same uh, time. There's something important about that notion that all, all, ultimately reality is no longer accessible firsthand, that everything is encoded through images. So what I'm showing you here is actually a close-up of an image on an atlas. And you can probably recognize here the dots that compose the image, the printing uh, of the image itself, and the word desert. What Giri is doing is basically creating a very essentialist representation of desert, that it's simultaneously specific and very generic, and that ultimately is a reminder that the desert in our minds exists through photographs and symbols related through photographs. Of his ideas, of his approach to reality, he said the only journey possible would now appear to be with signs and images within the destruction of direct experience. Now, this concept is perhaps more easily explored if we think about the role photography plays in our lives. And when we go somewhere for tourism purposes, which will happen soon again, I promise you, um, and you take pictures, the feeling compelled to take pictures is a beautiful thing and a terrible thing at the same time, because it has been claimed that when we take pictures, we technically insert a barrier between us and the real world. Of course, you can argue that this barrier, the camera, which has now become the phone, um, enhances the view, helps us to see more. But at the same time, it technically prevents us from seeing the object for what it is in front of us. Taking photographs of a site we encounter for the first time or a subject we encounter for the first time is simultaneously a way to be more present and a, a way to be absent from that very moment. It's a way to use the future, the idea of the photograph that you will look at again to relive the moment that you are living actually becomes the reason why you are not really living that moment in that moment. So think about it twice before you pull out that phone and camera. You can negotiate these moments in a less philosophical way and still enjoy life and have a great time. But if you're like Giri, thinking about these ideas um, with a conceptual slant, then things become more complicated. There's something fascinating about maps and how it's impossible to read maps in terms of economic and capitalist value. Agricultural lands, big cities, cities that are expensive, cities that are desirable, cities that are nowhere and that nobody wants to go to. And there is a sense by which um, maps on atlases are a metaphor of our understanding, our human understanding of the earth, of nature. It's nature rationalized. It's nature systematized, decoded, and translated. So what can we say when Giri, perhaps as one of his humorous moments as many happened in his career and even takes a picture of a starry sky. Think about systematizing and encoding, translating the universe and photographing it the way he does. It's important to appreciate, Gary, that you tune into his humor, a humor that in a sense shares quite a bit of what uh, I explored in the context of Arte Povera. You will remember that Arte Povera artists uh, like to be playful. It was, uh, I think, an Italian quality 
other um, artists working at the same time in other parts of the world don't quite mobilize this sort of humor. I think there's something specifically Italian of this moment that's interesting to explore. Like in the case of another series that I'm absolutely in love with called Colazione sull'erba. Colazione sull'erba, which is the breakfast on the grass, is a take on the very famous painting Manet made in 1863 called The Breakfast on the Grass. And it's this um, humorous take on the relationship between plants and urban realities. As you can see here, there is something rather funny about this beautiful historic wall frescoed with historical images of battles. And these sort of simple and assuming pots of geraniums that happen, of course, we guess by chance, to be organized from the smallest to the largest. This might be caused just by the way the sun hits these pots. Uh, and this window open, clearly somebody fond of red geraniums and then an intruder, a white geranium sticking out into the middle pot. Now the series uh, Colazione sull'erba has become very much loved by um, generally uh, photographers. Uh, it's, it's a kind of connoisseur's uh, item because it's the way in which Giri approaches simplicity and composition. You can see here again, there, there are questions about why are these pots positioned the way they are? What's in the um, metrics? It's almost like these are minimalist pieces of music in a way. And at times suggesting violence and alienation, the same alienation we saw in, the, in those who live in the periphery, this little rose bush with a support cane behind bars. Or as you can see here, this rather unhappy bush that's been trimmed in a kind of like uh, an orthodox way, almost replicating somehow the geometrical vernacular of the motif that's impressed in the concrete wall behind it. And all along, of course, Giri captures this typical uh, Italian periphery um, motif of the shutter that it's pulled down, especially uh, during the summer months uh, when it becomes too warm. Uh, in other series, Giri is concerned with the construction of space and how things are situated. Why do we situate certain objects like a bench between two palm trees as we do here? And how do we explore alienation or communion between the human and the natural environment. Again, one of my favorite images called Bologna, where you can see here that uh, Giri does something he learns to do best. I'll show you another couple of examples that are really fascinating, in which we see this very um, unhappy uh, seaside painting where rough waves menace this couple in which Unfortunately, the lady seems a little uninterested and somewhat unimpressed with her companion who looks at her with a sense of uh, alienation and loss, wondering what will it be of this lunch that has uh, possibly just begun, as we see here, all we have is bread and a drink. Perhaps she's only waiting for food to be delivered, but perhaps the sea painted behind them in a very rough way is commenting on their moons. And uh, this beautiful image again, Salzburg, you can see how conceptual Giri is, photographing people who are looking at a map. Uh, of course, they're going to venture, hopefully, in the beautiful Alpine uh, landscape. But of course, because of the work he has already uh, done, uh, beforehand, we know that maps are extremely important to Giri as a metaphor of how impossible it is for us to understand the natural world beyond representation, beyond the synthesis of maps and culture. So here they are, it looks like they're staring at a real landscape. The landscape is already become a map. And again, here, a very interesting continuation 
uh, stylistic between the um, advertisement of Sprite and the background, the natural background right behind it, as well as an example of what is called now post photography, which is an engagement with photographs, making photographs using other people's photographs. Now, this beautiful image, as you can see, is of postcards. And photographing postcards means to appropriate images that other photographers, most often anonymous photographers, have already taken. These are photographs made for commercial purposes, and they are unproblematic. They are tourist items, tourist views of beautiful sunsets. So they're very distant from the criticality that Giri is interested in. And they're all sunsets because, of course, that's what people like, that they used to like to send. But sunsets are very meaningful in um, the history of art and representation. It's the end of the day. There's a spiritual sublime quality. And then at the center, right here in the middle, there's absence, there's the negation of it all. We actually see the construction of um, Italy as a tourist attraction revealed and right behind is a bare wall and the metal stand. And again, another example here, I know I'm indulging with Giri, but he really does deserve it. He was an incredible Italian pioneer, but you can see how he plays with the juxtaposition of real bricks and bricks on a billboard. The creases in this case on the billboard itself are essential in order to reveal the illusion. A lot of what Giri did at this time during the 70s was based on this contextual questioning of reality. What is reality and how can I access it if everything is a photograph, if all I can see ultimately is photographs. And this is the last image uh, taken by Giri, as I mentioned earlier, who died at the age of 49 in uh, 1992 because of a heart attack. Uh, this uh, image was found in an undeveloped film and it's considered to be the part of the very last series of images um, taken by Giri. It's of the Po Valley, which is where Giri lived extensively throughout his life. And I think for as coincidental as it is, it's, it's incredible. I think that his last picture should be this perfect central perspective in which the subject disappears at the horizon engulfed in this fog. And for somebody who's dedicated his life to exploring the landscape, the Italian landscape, always searching for new ways to problematize it culturally and contextually, this really seems uh, a perfect ending uh, to his career, or thought premature, sadly so. Uh, I'm gonna speed up a little. I've got more to show you. Franco Fontana from the realism and contextual critical interpretation of Giri to abstraction. Fontana never used Photoshop and never um, manipulated his photographs, but you can see how he speaks almost a geometrical language uh, of advertising in which he crops the image and saturates the colors during printing in order to abstract the Italian landscape. And in a sense, renders it a little anonymous, a little generic, but nonetheless particularly pleasant and particularly welcoming. Uh, a very different take, again, returning to the political is provided by Guido Guidi, one, again, uh, very notable uh, artist, photographer, who plays with the notion of pseudo-documentary, so documentary but not quite, especially in the context of the man-altered landscape. He creates a sense um, of alienation again, especially in the context of um, the subjects that he photographs. This is Gibellina in Sicily. And those of you who have been uh, attending my talks in the past might remember that I talked about Gibellina before during my Arte Povera uh, presentations because of the destruction that took place in Gibellina of the earthquake that took place in um, 1968 and which was 
then the principle of one of the biggest works of land art by Alberto Burri, a work that you can walk through and experience in a sense the aftermath, the loss of Gibellina. What we find uh, Guido Guidi doing is reinterpreting this uh, spaces, the loneliness of the new Gibellina, which is again the promise of something that should have been uh, more positive and that in a sense left um, many disappointed. Uh, there is something sp specifically um, recognizable about Guido Guidi's uh, approach to the landscape because we return to this idea of loneliness and alienation. Ideas of urban reality as well as the countryside are really important to him. These are the concerns that we have already explored with Arte Povera. And in this picture from 1996, he's showing us a reality uh, that was still common then and that no longer really is in which factories were still incorporated in the fabric of cities like Milan. What used to be the periphery no longer is the periphery because the cities have expanded so much and these factories remained as artifacts of a previous time stuck into the urban fabric of um, other social realities eventually being reclaimed and turned into luxury apartments. Again, the alienation uh, and the simplicity of these images, the immortalization of rural realities that are becoming less and less desirable and more distant from the center of things. Uh, Mimo Jodice is another incredible contemporary photographer. You can see here uh, a beautiful image in which again the um, conceptual dimension predominates. We see a very bare and flat uh, landscape of Emilia Romagna and uh, this palm tree that it's kept uh, from dying in an enclosure. This idea of the separation between the natural and the artificial that returns uh, in the exploration of the Italian landscape of the time. And also people gathering together like we saw earlier in other occasion, in this case, Il Volo dell'Angelo a Giuliano, you can see uh, in this image from 1972, modern architecture juxtaposed to older uh, realities, historical buildings like a church, and the use of technology in order to enhance um, spiritual gatherings, uh, part of the um, the, the calendar of celebrations of the uh, Italian church. There's something involuntarily uh, humorous about the suspension, the visible suspension of this modern angel and people crowding on balconies to witness something that veers slightly towards the grotesque. And uh, this beautiful image um, also gives me the opportunity to mention the depth to surrealism and also to the painting of Giorgio de Chirico. You can see how there is this sense of alienation that I've talked about uh, a few times that is not coming from nowhere, is not just generated by photographers um, independently. There is a very specific thread of this loneliness, as you can see here, no people uh, populating um, these images that are um, important to the understanding of where is the Italy of the now during the 1970s and 80s. And then again, beautiful images um, that are perhaps more part of a, a classical surrealist repertoire, like you can see here again, Mimo Giudice with this composition in which abstraction and rhythm uh, are the essential markers of a, a beautiful aesthetic that it's bound to everyday life and simplicity. Again, a working class scenario, the juxtaposition between purity and decay, all this white and the walls and the absence and presence. Of course, the idea of clothing that always represents a person that should be wearing it, in this case, almost acquiring a ghostly aura. And again, in this image of Naples in which you can see uh, metal, corrugated metal boards 
used to protect a building, a classical building that uh, during the phase of restoration, that's something really um, charming about the metal also having is its own motif that has a classical vein in the fluting of the uh, column as you see here, but obviously the metal reflective quality uh, sort of trips the viewer. It's simultaneously a sign of progress and the allusion to a temple of modernity, one that it's already tarnished and one that perhaps is actually uh, foil thin. Uh, back to the landscape, another important artist in the history of Italian photography and the question of the landscape is certainly Vittore Fossati, who uh, collaborated and studied with Luigi Ghirri um, during the 1980s. And uh, Vittore Fossati is very much the um, leader of a quiet movement towards an appreciation of landscape. His photography is, is grounded in simplicity and subtlety, as you can see here, in which we see this um, fragmentation of the land sort of suggesting a mountain within uh, a mountain. And in this case, um, again, the idea of simplicity, the artifice and reality in which a rainbow that's generated by an irrigation system used for agricultural, mass agricultural production is creating an enchanting moment that nonetheless is not quite as natural and uh, momentary as a real rainbow would be. So these questions about the reality, the technological, the facade, the behind the facade keep returning in the vernaculars that these photographers explore. And moving up in time, again, the exploration of the landscape in Italy through the work of Massimo Vitali. I wouldn't be surprised if many of you may have seen the work of Massimo Vitali because it has circulated extensively over the past 10 years, actually 10 years. I remember a few of his prints um, were brought to the uh, Expo in Chicago. And um, Vitali takes pictures of social, Moment, moments of uh, recreation. So tourism, Italians enjoying themselves uh, as a group. He basically believes that it's only in circumstances of recreation that the true psychological dimension of a population is made to emerge. And as you can see, his photographs acquire a rhythmic quality in which people become anonymous and small and they sort of populate the image like little dots, almost like little crustaceans in a marine uh, setting. And of course, some of his images tend to acquire a critical tone, like we can see here in this uh, work that shows us people enjoying uh, a rather rocky beach very close to an industrial establishment, so raising questions about the purity, the cleanliness of the water, and also the quality of uh, the enjoyment, and also the deterioration of many beautiful landscapes in Italy. The deterioration of Italian landscape is certainly um, becoming a prominent uh, preoccupation among many photographers and among others, Oliviero Toscani has certainly voiced his concern over the past 20 years with a project called Il Nuovo Paesaggio Italiano. Uh, Il Nuovo Paesaggio Italiano, as you can see here, is not quite as beautiful and it's a project launched by Oliviero Toscani, uh, raised by the concern for the ruination, the constant ruination of the Italian landscape by architecture as well as industries that indiscriminately um, take over beautiful places. And this project is actually open to everyone willing to contribute to it. So Oliviero Toscani is not taking these images himself, but he's actually inviting submissions online. It becomes an archive, an ever building archive, I have to say of doom and gloom, because clearly um, the images are not flattering and they're not beautiful in the traditional sense. But at the same time, Oliviero Toscani really believes in the idea that we have to use 
photography as a weapon in order to generate awareness and change people's mind. And some of you will certainly remember the images that Oliviero Toscani took throughout his career uh, for Benetton. Now, United Colors of Benetton became probably the only uh, clothing brand to never show their clothes on billboards. And instead, Oliviero Toscani masterminded these conceptual photographs that um, materialized a very distinct uh, identity for the brand itself. Like this um, billboard caused a lot of controversy in 1990 when uh, during the height of the AIDS pandemic, uh, nobody wanted to talk about, of course, the deaths and Oliviero Toscani came up with this incredibly stark image of um, somebody dying of AIDS and ec echoing a sort of religious um, history of religious painting in the process. And of course, his um, constant, some find almost heavy handed um, reiteration of the important, importance of diversity and inclusion that became the trademark of United Colors of Benetton. And I just want to wrap up my talk before I um, overstay my welcome uh, time uh, with two Italian, uh, female Italian protagonists in the world of photography. One is Paola Di Bello, uh, and I'm just gonna flash a few images by Silvia Camporesi who will be with us uh, over the next a few weeks for a conversation. Now, Paola Di Bello is a really interesting conceptual photographer. Um, she started traveling around the city of Milan in, on her bicycle, as she said uh, in an interview when she was 14, 15, mapping the city of Milan with a friend. She said, you take our maps and um, try to get to understand and learn the city area by area. They were very systematic. And that love for Milan has never left her. You can see here that she's actually taking these images from a very interesting point of view. Um, Paola Di Bello is very philosophically grounded in her work. So she looks at photography as a conceptual tool. And she always was fascinated with this notion of discarded objects and how discarded objects still have an essence, still have a presence, perhaps even more when we cannot use them anymore. There are philosophers who have talked about this idea, like Heidegger, um, that an object becomes visible when it loses its function. That was the principle of Duchamp's ready-made uh, objects as well. So upon finding the objects that we see in these photographs on her way, she tilts the camera so that the object still retains its importance and um, rightness in a sense. That makes the rest look wrong. So she hopes that we can relate to reality in a different way. Uh, in this work, um, she actually used uh, goalposts, as you can see here, as frames. And the title, Fuori Campo, uh, is a um, football, part of a football jargon, part of the football jargon. And in this case, it works as a frame. You can see the goalpost working as a frame to highlight peripheries of uh, Naples that are... Um, Fuori campo, meaning out of field, meaning out of the um, cultural life and out of the conception of what Italy is and what Italy has to offer. Just to wrap up very quickly, um, Silvia Camporesi, who we will talk to in a few weeks, and these beautiful images that are part of a uh, project called Atlas uh, Italia, in which um, she traveled the country looking for abandoned places from villages, towns to institutions and uh, factories in order to capture an Italy that no longer is disappearing, but also that um, questions the very notion of purpose, questions the very notion of history, past and present. 
And on this note, we've come to the end of our four lectures on the history of Italian photography. And I hope to have mapped at least some of the essential concerns that make contemporary Italian photography what it is. A very exciting and uh, growing field. And again, don't forget about our up and coming conversations with two amazing Italian photographers to complete our journey on the subject. Thank you very much, Giovanni. You did really great. You definitely did a great job for mapping this history of photography. And I hope that especially tonight, our friends who attended will then explore the, the work of uh, Gabriele Basilico, because I remember also his architectural series uh, with a, astonishing perspectives and geometries. And they could also make an ideal tour of Italy with uh, Letizia Battaglia uh, describing a dramatic situation in Palermo with her civic engagement, the representation of Venice by Gianni Berengo Gardin and, um, and Mimo Iodice in Napoli, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But so the, all these would uh, uh, deserve a specific focus on, on their work. And mentioning this, I take you seriously regarding Luigi Ghirri because I'm also fascinated uh, by his work. And actually, I would um, I would dare to um, uh, to uh, to already say that we can meet again February next year to remember uh, Luigi Ghirri on his uh, on the day of his passing. So we could uh, focus. That would on be amazing. Work. It would be definitely very, extremely, extremely interesting for for all of us. Yes, it will be an anniversary, of course. Yeah. Then, uh, so before that, uh, I would like to uh, remind everyone about the two conversations with Marco Garofalo and Silvio Camporesi. We will uh, host in uh, June, in a few weeks' time. And of course, that's all uh, Giovanni's presentations are available on, on YouTube and on the, um, on the YouTube channel, the Italian Cultural Institute in Chicago. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Giovanni, and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very Bye. much, Luca, and thank you all for attending. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye.